Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel, Wild Like a Flower Gardening. Today I wanted to put together a little video before I get too carried away with plants and moving into the spring growing season to just talk about some basics behind butterflies and moths. Um, I feel that sometimes with pollinator gardening, it can be a little intimidating if you don't feel educated or if you don't understand a lot of, you know, the insects and the biology behind them or the ecology behind the plants. And that can be a real turnoff for people who are thinking about trying something new. So this video is going to cover the life cycles of butterflies and moths and introduce the concept of host plants. Now you don't have to know everything about something in order to love it um, or to value it, you know, so you don't need to even remember any of this to be a good pollinator gardener. Okay, this is just, you know, for the adults who don't know, and if you want to share this video with children, you know, the more the merrier. We're going to start with when butterfly and moth eggs are laid on their host plants, okay? Once those eggs hatch, these really tiny caterpillars will emerge. You can sometimes hardly see them with your eyes. Um, you occasionally may need a hand lens um, to be able to view them once they're fresh out of the eggs. Monarchs, for instance, are like super tiny. Um, so you gotta sometimes be careful too when you're rummaging around on your plants that if you're expecting a caterpillar this big, you're not really going to find them. You may find really, really tiny guys that your thumbs could squish as you, you know, rummage through your plants. So they emerge from that egg and the first thing they're gonna do is they eat that eggshell that they were just inside of, their egg case, and they move on to start munching on their host plant. Now, host plants are really important because the mother butterfly cannot lay her eggs on other plants if they use a specific host plant. Something to make this easy to understand, I'll go with the species everybody knows, the monarch butterfly. So the monarch butterfly has to lay their eggs on milkweed species. If there is not milkweed in your garden, you will not have monarch eggs in your garden and you will not have monarch caterpillars in your garden. You may have monarchs flying through, drinking some of the nectar that's available, but you're not going to have anyone that calls your backyard or your garden home. Understand? Cool. So they start munching away on their host plant. Once you find signs of herbivory, which means the plants have been chewed on by these teeny tiny caterpillars or big, depends on what stage they're in, uh, you'll likely see, you know, munch, like munch marks all the way around them. Once the caterpillars get pretty big, they'll really start to take off large chunks of the leaves and eat their way through almost whole leaves sometimes. Um, so once they get larger, they're a lot easier to find. You can also see caterpillar frass, um, which is their, you know, their caterpillar poop. And that's another good sign that either a caterpillar was just recently there or there's one on the plant somewhere nearby and you have to be careful as you look through. So caterpillars, how I'm talking about, they're gonna go from different sizes, right? Those are called instars. So a caterpillar eats, eats, and eats. Think about the hungry caterpillar. As they eat, they've gotta grow just like you and I, but in order to get larger, they have to shed their skin and emerge in a larger form. So as a caterpillar sheds its old skin and moves into its larger body, um, that's called an instar. So first instar, second, third, fourth, fifth. Um, once a caterpillar is ready to go into its chrysalis, um, into the pupa stage, and eventually emerge into an adult, um, that's when they shed their last caterpillar looking skin and a chrysalis is what um, you'll see. It's really fun to watch monarchs do this if you've ever been able to um, see monarchs being raised. Same with black swallowtails. I know that's a common um, captive raised butterfly. If you know, you don't normally see this in the wild. I think I do have a photograph, I'll pop it up here, of a caterpillar that recently entered its pupa stage and formed that chrysalis on the outside. They're gonna be in their chrysalis, or the difference with moths is that they form a cocoon, which looks kind of a little bit more fuzzy and furry on the outside, like um, kind of like spider's webbing. Uh, I'll pop some pictures of that up here as well so you can see the difference. Awesome, okay. So caterpillars and moths, they have very similar needs and life cycles. They often require those host plants um, and then they move into the pupa stage where then they emerge you know, as their adult wing form. Once they emerge as their adult wing form, their main purpose is to mate 
and if they're a female, to lay eggs. Now, some really interesting species like luna moths, they eat a lot while they're caterpillars, right? Because they've got to become a really big moth. But once they emerge as adults, they lack the mouthpieces to eat food. So they won't even eat. They live for a short period of time and they mate, they lay eggs, and they pass away. I believe I have a pretty awesome photo of it that I caught in the backyard that'll pop up. Isn't that sweet? They're gorgeous, they're gorgeous, but they don't get to eat as adults. So do we consider them a pollinator? Mm. So I introduced the concept of host plants with the monarch butterfly, right? So the monarch butterfly relies on milkweed species. Now milkweed is really cool. There are a lot of different milkweeds. You can have common, showy, swamp, butterfly weed, um, hairy balls milkweed, um, world milkweed, there's, there's so many, right? So there are also a variety of caterpillars that eat milkweed. So on a milkweed, you may find monarch caterpillars, super awesome, but you may also see things like queen butterfly caterpillars. You may see milkweed tussock moths on there as well. So milkweed doesn't always mean just monarch butterflies. Having milkweed in your garden will bring a variety of caterpillars and butterflies to call your garden home. And that's really important because you're getting more bang for your buck. Not to mention when milkweed flowers, it does provide a nice nectar source for all the pollinators that are gonna come through your garden. Now, another really popular group of butterflies are the swallowtail butterflies. And they have some variety, not only in themselves, but in the host plants that they use. So for instance, um, the really fun one, the zebra swallowtail, that uses pawpaw trees. Now I haven't experimented with growing pawpaw trees yet because I'm in an apartment. There's no point in me trying to grow any like trees here, um, but I would love to make sure that if I have property down the road that I've got some shrubby pawpaw trees because zebra swallowtails are really cool and that's their host plant, right? And if you've not had a pawpaw, like the fruit, I highly recommend it. They're something totally weird and wacky, but they're great. So zebra swallowtails require pawpaw trees. If you're looking to add some sort of shrubby tree to your garden, pawpaws would be great. Now, often people, when they plant pawpaws, they try to do a grove, they do multiples because they need male and females in order to fruit eventually. Another really common and popular butterfly would be the black swallowtail butterfly. Now this one is a little bit more common in your gardens because they require a variety of host plants and they tend to also use Queen Anne's lace, which at this point, Queen Anne's lace has been relatively naturalized on the landscape, but it's not a true North American native plant. Did you know that? You do now. Stop intentionally growing Queen Anne's lace in your garden, please. Thank you. Replace it with the natives, because there are native varieties that are very similar that you could grow. Um, but anyways, so black swallowtails, they'll use Queen Anne's Lace, they'll use dill, parsley, rue, uh, but what I want to grow for them is a native plant to North America and Ohio, which is Golden Alexanders. It's a lovely yellow flowering plant um, that is going to be, I don't know, a little bit more beneficial than something like Queen Anne's Lace, because Queen Anne's Lace also just takes over. The seeds spread really easily and you see it everywhere in roadsides. Queen Anne's Lace has enough real estate, okay? Plant some things like Golden Alexanders because they're native and in my opinion, there aren't as many on the landscape. You don't see Golden Alexanders as often as you see Queen Anne's Lace. So let's flip the script maybe. So anyways, I digress. Native plants, right? A couple other butterflies that you may not even know the name of. You may have seen these butterflies come through your garden and thought that they were really neat, but you didn't know who they are, and that is totally okay. So another really great butterfly is the Great Spangled Fritillary. Isn't that not like super fun to say? Anyways, um, so the Great Spangled Fritillary <laughs> uses plants like violets. Now violets will often pop up naturally in garden spaces, um, but some people look at them like they're weeds or they're inconvenient and they'll rip them out. So if you happen to have violets growing in your backyard or in your garden, I highly recommend just leaving them. Um, and there's also a variety of violets if you are looking to intentionally plant them. You can get some that are purple, white, yellow, you can go crazy. And they're really just little short indescript plants that don't take up a whole lot of space and you end up with beautiful pollinators like the Great Spangled Fritillary in your yard, which is fantastic. Another one of my favorite butterflies is the American Lady. 
I wonder why, right? So she, or he, is very beautiful. And for their host plant, they use plantain leaved pussy toes. Sounds really funny, but it's a very nondescript plant. It's not very tall. Um, its leaves look kind of fuzzy and it has little white flowers. I believe it's more of a spring blooming plant, but it could go into summer. Um, and that's one that I have seen for sale at some greenhouses, and I believe that you can find seeds online for it. The basics of butterflies is that you have to have their host plant. Otherwise, that life cycle does not start in your garden. If you want to see your butterflies, you have to make sure that you have host plants for them. You know, provide them with the housing that they require, and you'll get to visit with them. You know, it's simple. So if you don't know where to start in discovering, you know, what host plants do I want to grow because I don't know what butterflies are here, super easy. What I want you to do is look up common butterflies of blank, your state, okay? So once you do that, usually you'll find government resources or blogs. I would go with as many, you know, verified resources like from your Department of Natural Resources or Conservation and use those sources because those are the most, um, those are the most reliable lists. Once you look at that list, kind of get a feel for some of the butterflies that you've seen in your garden already. Take a look at the ones that you recognize. Don't overwhelm yourself with the ones that you don't. And take a look at what their host plants are and ask yourself, am I growing this in my garden? If you're not growing it in your garden, try to find out if you can. Whether you introduce it by seeds or you introduce it with plant starts, either way. So from there, you have a baseline of making sure that you're providing host plants for the butterflies that you know already visit, you know, for nectar, for instance. From there, you can continue your observations on butterflies or you could go blind and you could take a species that you know is relatively common with a host plant you think is manageable for your garden and introduce it and see if they arrive. I'm going to bring up a couple of my favorite resources that I've used to investigate um, native plants and the pollinators that use them. Um, I'd first like to start because honestly, you're not going to find many Michiganders who are willing to say how much they love Ohio. And I'll be completely honest, in my humble opinion, Ohio is one of the leading states for work with pollinator habitat. There, I said it. Come at me, honestly. So. With that being said, Ohio's Department of Natural Resources does this really fantastic thing where they put out these PDFs or these little booklets on all sorts of groups of animals. For instance, we've got songbirds of Ohio, birds of prey of Ohio, fish of Ohio, amphibians of Ohio, reptiles of Ohio, mammals of Ohio, and my favorite, okay, butterflies and skippers of Ohio, moths of Ohio common bees and wasps of Ohio. These are free, F-R-E-E, -E. okay? I love them because I do a lot of education with children and you know, we all know that moment. Even when we were children, we knew when we felt this way, when our eyes are like sparkling and we are so curious about something and so excited about something and we love something and these kids are having a blast going through my guides trying to figure out what something is and they're on an adventure, they're investigating, they're like little naturalist detectives, right? Who wants to stop that, right? My favorite moment is when I say, here, you can keep this, take it home. Because why? This was free to me. It doesn't bother me to hand it off. I'm not made of money. I can't hand off some of my books that I've paid for. But these are really great because when you come across somebody who's very curious and interested, you can just let them keep this and it doesn't cost you anything. Now, if you're not in Ohio and you don't plan to travel here soon, which I don't recommend because, you know, we're not really supposed to be traveling for fun right now, go online. Go to Ohio Department of Natural Resources and they have PDF guides for all of these. Now, I can't say that Ohio has all of the same species as your state, but if you're one of the neighboring states like Michigan, um, these guides are very applicable. You know, I do think that Ohio has a little bit more diversity than a state like Michigan, but you're going to get you know, the same idea and a lot of similar information. 
Again, you still want to look up your particular state's information, but if you don't have access to great resources because not every state puts them together, stuff like this is great and you can download the PDFs, you know, and have them without wasting any paper. So free resources aside, I want to talk about some books that I have been getting really, really, really excited about. Um, now, mind you, I'm not affiliated with any of the resources that I use, okay? I'll be honest. Um, I'm just a nerd and a big fan, okay? So if you have not heard of Heather Holm yet, I highly, highly, highly recommend checking her out. I don't know if I could ever reach the heights of someone like Heather Holm. My brain cannot wrap around the amount of time and energy it must have taken to put these books together. I go through her books, Heather, if you find this, I go through your books and I just am in awe that you put something this thorough together, okay? So I'm gonna start with my first book that I'm really, really, really excited about. This one is The Pollinators of Native Plants by Heather Holm. So this book, for instance, it focuses on the plants um, with giving lots of information. For instance, here's butterfly weed. So this gives you lots of lots of information on the plants themselves. Sun, shade, wet, dry, you name it, it's in here. So you can better understand how to grow that plant. But what she also does is she tells you who uses this. So we're on butterfly weed, right? She'll tell you it's a larval host plant of the monarch butterfly, queen butterfly, and milkweed tussock moth, like I had discussed earlier. Then it also mentions honeybees and hummingbirds will also use you know, this as a nectar source. So you get an idea as you go through it, who uses this plant along with some, and this, this is what blows my mind. The, the photographs, like, the photographs of all of the other pollinators and insects that find themselves on these plants, not just the ones that we know use them consistency, but the ones that will use them because they're there it just blows my mind the amount of time and energy it would take to even just do one plant i just anyways this is like what dreams are made of i'll be honest and that book it goes through uh wetland edge woodland edge and prairie edge so if you have more of a wet soggy garden you can look at her wetland edge and aim for plants um, that would do best in those growing conditions and then once you find out what plants would go best in your wet, you know, soggy backyard, you can then look at what pollinators use them and tailor it based on what pollinators you know are in your yard or you want to see in your yard. Anyways, here is another book that I am super, super, super stoked about. I know we're talking about butterflies and moths, but this one, I'll just do a quick plug, is another Heather Home book. This one is all about bees. So you flip through here and you see lots of information on... Um, how to support native bees. Again, the pictures blow my mind. Heather, your pictures blow my mind. Like I see here and I sometimes can't even read these books because I am so lost in thought, again, about what it takes to put this together. This is just an amazing feat in my humble, humble, tiny opinion. Amazing, right? So you get to pretty much learn the answers to all of your questions about the pollinators that may be in your backyard. Now, if you, again, can't afford books like this, or these may be, you know, a little over your head at the moment, go for those free guides. Look up on websites those basic lists. You know, you don't have to get crazy with it, but it is nice to have some of these books because as you see things in real life and then you flip through the books, you then realize how many things you do recognize. And again, you don't need to know everything about it. You don't even need to know its name to value it and create habitat for it. In fact, if you could do one thing, focus on learning about pollinators or creating habitat, I would say create the habitat first and then learn after you get to see who comes and visits your garden. Because as we see our steep declines in pollinators across this country, if not the planet, what's more important right now is habitat creation. And if we don't have host plants, we don't have butterflies and moths. 
So take a look at what host plants you want to incorporate in your garden this summer. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop comments below. Subscribe to my channel because as we get into the growing season, I'm going to be showing you how to start these host plants from seeds and how to incorporate them into your gardens. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really hope you learned a little bit from this video and I hope that you know you feel more comfortable putting pollinator plants in your garden and I hope that you just get excited. Just get excited because these are amazing creatures and to give them a place to live is one of the most like humbling experiences you're gonna have, truly. So thanks for joining me, happy gardening.